for sticking around. I appreciate it. I mean, this is a, a, a very good panel. What we've, what we've tried to pull together here is just sort of like the next phase. We have our, uh, the president who's taking actions that are impacting companies. We have Congress that is listening and trying to take actions that are impacting companies. So what we wanted to do today is try to bring to you, break it down, how is this impacting companies? What are the impacts of the tariffs? How does it impact the manufacturing? How does it impact the, uh, the farmers? And how does it impact our exports? Because again, it's the toe bone connected to the foot bone, to the ankle bone, all the way up to the head. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start ask, by asking Laura to, um, and, and their bios are in your packet if you'd like to look those up. And in the interest of time, since we only have 45 minutes, which I think is a very short time to have a very good discussion on um, these issues, which are incredibly important, I'm going to go ahead and, and dive right in. And Laura, ask if you can sort of talk to us about what you're sensing, because you do a lot of economic analyses and studies. So give us an idea of what you're seeing and what, what your findings have been. Sure, thanks. It's all about various bones connected to various bones and all the way up to your head. And um, that's the basically the one thing that I really want, I hope that you all take away from this, is when you're trying to get a sense of how a tariff affects an economy, you have to look at all of the various moving parts, and there are a lot of them. You've got, um, you've got uh, consumers to think about, and it's not just consumers that are households, it's consumers that are manufacturers and farmers and services companies they buy things, uh, both imports and U.S. produced goods. You've got the U.S. producers who, who uh, produce things that compete with the imported product. They win uh, when a tariff is imposed. Um, and you have to consider the impacts of tariffs on them. You have to look at all of the different up and the downstream ways that a tariff raises costs such that U.S. producers are able to produce more, U.S. consumers have to pay more, and maybe buy less. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting to think about, and a lot of the studies that are out there don't take this into consideration. If you all remember when the government shutdown happened, all the, all the press reports that were out there about how um, it, it was uh, people who were no longer working, no longer spending money, weren't uh, sending their kids to daycare anymore. Uh, they weren't using Uber anymore. They cut back on going out to restaurants. There is an impact of reduced consumer spending caused by a job loss, for example, or by the higher costs of a car or of a widget. And that filters through to restaurants, to daycare, to education, to um, arts and entertainment services. You don't go to movies so much anymore. So there's all those ripple effects, too, that result from a tariff. So we try, when we look at, when somebody asks us to figure out what the cost of this four is, or of the 232 tariffs. We use the model that the International Trade Commission uses, which is, enables us to capture all of those various moving parts. Tariff Hurts the Heartland asked us to take a look at all of the um, tariff scenarios that were in play as of last November, uh, which uh, different scenarios that were proposed or in effect as of last November that were coming down the pipe. Uh, the two that are most relevant to us today are what's the impact of the tariffs on lists one, two, and three from China, as well as the steel and aluminum uh, uh, tariffs. And we estimated, using that big model that captures all of those different ways the tariffs affect the economy, that it was going to, um, the other thing I want to emphasize too is that these effects take some time. They don't all happen the day that the tariffs go into effect. It takes time, as you've heard, for companies to look for alternative sources of supply and to move their supply chains. It takes time for them to pass through um, the cost increases to their consumers. All of it takes one to three years, typically, before you really start to see the impact of the impacts that we get when we look at these models and we do these estimates. So one to three years from now, after these tariffs have been in effect, we are finding that the hit to the US GDP could be a negative 0.37% for list one, two, and three in steel and aluminum tariffs. Um, $767 per average
average family of four in terms of higher costs that they have to pay when they go out and buy something, and potentially the loss of 934,000 U.S. jobs, net. That's taking the pluses and the minuses, net 934. If we move to list four, tariffs on list four, plus all that other stuff, it really magnifies the impacts of the costs of the tariffs. We're getting a minus 1% hit to GDP. Um, $2,300 per family of four in higher spending, and in excess of two million net job losses. So the bottom, the bottom line, our, 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 our sermon that we're preaching is, you know, if you like tariffs, fine. If you want to use them as a policy tool, fine. Just know what you're doing when you use them. Go into it with your eyes wide open. That's it. Great. Thank you, Laura, very much. Um, we also have up here today, we have Guy Harari, who is the president of Adiseo North and Central America. And um, he's going to speak to us about how a company plays into this uh, complete supply chain and how it impacts at the end of the day. So Guy, if you would share with us. Good morning. It's a really a pleasure and an honor to be here to share our, our story. And I appreciate you both for the invitation and for the, for the group. Um, so my name is Guy Harari. Guy guy named Guy, <laughs> forget it anymore. Um, I was born and raised in Brazil. I am married to an American citizen. I am American citizen myself. My wife's parents are from Morocco and the former Czechoslovakia. I work for a French company owned by the Chinese. So I <laughs> just give a little bit of the context of uh, being in, in the global world and how important it is to be in the global markets and have the right tools to, to, to be able to, to play in, the, in this industry. Our company, so it's a French company, uh, it was created 75 years ago, and we are in the nutritional feed additive business. We produce feed additive that goes into animal production. One of our main products is called methylene. So I would like you, if you could repeat with me, methylene. Methylene. You got it. So what is methylene? Methylene is a key ingredient for the production of chicken and other meat. In order to talk about methylene, we need to talk about food, supply chain, how do we bring products from a farm to, a, to your house. Um, when you produce chicken, I'll talk about chicken because 90% of methylene goes into the, <coughs> into the broiler and uh, turkey and eggs production. So, when you produce chicken, you need to build muscle, which is meat, that meat is, is muscle. Muscle is protein. And in order to, to build protein, you need amino acids. So amino acids are building blocks of protein. We have amino acids in, in our muscles. Chickens, they have amino acids in their, in their muscle. Um, we find amino acids in corn and soy. Those are the main ingredients that goes into, into <coughs> chicken feed. <coughs> Without methylene, you would have to use a lot more corn, a lot more soy, in order to produce the same amount of chicken. Why is that? Uh, chickens, they need an essential amino acids to build protein, to build muscle. They get it from corn and soy. However, they need to balance different amino acids, about 10 different essential amino acids, and they need to be balanced to form a protein chain. If you have excess amino acids, basically, where is it going to end up? Manure, chicken sheet. So, the chicken industry for the last uh, 70 years has been optimizing the production of chicken in order to reduce manure, to, inc to increase, to, to improve what we call feed conversion. In the past, you used like a, maybe three or four or five pounds of uh, feed, mostly corn and soy, to produce one pound of chicken. Nowadays, you use about 1.7 pounds of corn and soy to produce one pound of chicken. So the agriculture uh, industry is one that has produced the highest level of productivity over the years. And when we, we all that are in the, in the, in the animal production industry, and I, I, I see a 
some faces here from the pork association, from the chicken association. When we, when we wake up every morning, our duty is how do I contribute to feed a growing population with affordable meat in a sustainable way. And there's no other technology in the world like amino acid balancing that can produce such great results. So methanides is one of those uh, amino acids and this product is now on the list number three and is now hitting 25% uh, duty. We produce uh, methionine, liquid methionine, which is the, the favorite uh, <coughs> form of methionine used by the chicken industry. We produce it in China and now it's basically it's prohibitive to bring uh, the product uh, into, uh, into the US. What happens if you don't have methionine? If you don't have methionine, as I said, you're going to consume much more corn and soy, produce a lot more uh, uh, manure. Uh, the chicken houses will have more ammonia. Uh, the health of the chickens will not be the same. So it's basically impossible in modern agriculture to produce chicken or pork without methane. It's a must. Uh, without methane, you produce 40% more uh, manure than uh, you would if, uh, if you don't have methane. Um, so what, what does it take to produce a product like this? So methane is a very, uh, the production process is a very complex process. It takes very dangerous chemical products, mostly oil derivatives, and a worldwide world class uh, plant would have a capacity of about 100 to 150,000 metric tons per year, and the investment is about half a billion dollars. This is what we invested in China in our plant, and we have an ongoing investment for a second plant in China also, we invest another half a billion dollars uh, to be able to cope with a growing demand. As you guys know, uh, chicken is the most affordable and the most uh, globally the most popular uh, yeah, affordable meat because uh, anyone would eat uh, chicken. Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, everybody would eat chicken. There's no <laughs> restriction and it's the most affordable uh, meat. So consumption continues to grow. Population is growing significantly and as people start uh, increasing their income, they are going to start eating more, uh, more meat. So in order to cope with demand, we need to start, we need to build, the industry needs to build a new plant every other year. The market grows about five to six percent per year. And in order to be able to cope with demand, a lot of investment needs to be made. Uh, by not allowing the import of this kind of product from China, we're basically going to increase the cost of uh, chicken production. We are going to be paying more uh, for chicken in, in the supermarket. Uh, the chicken industry will have a higher cost, production cost, and will be less competitive. Today, the US exports about 20% of uh, chicken production. We are second uh, to Brazil, which is uh, producing chicken with a cost uh, about seven to eight percent less than the US. So if we continue putting trade barriers on key regions and making agriculture more difficult and losing our global space in, uh, in, in trade, uh, it's going to be uh, damaging for the, whole, uh, for the whole industry, for the consumer, for agriculture, and that's, uh, that's not a good thing. So appreciate the opportunity to educate you guys a little bit on, uh, on what we do and uh, what we are facing nowadays. Thank you, Guy. We also have Eric Winberg, he's the Executive Director of the Specialty Soya and Grain Alliance, and so we're going to get a little bit different perspective of how this is impacting the U.S. Thank you, Nicole. The point with my being here was to try and demonstrate for you uh, that the impact of the trade tariffs uh, does impact our farms and farmers. It's also impacting our rural entrepreneurs that are exporting and providing product. Uh, but in a stranger and, I think, uh, more telling ways uh, that suck the, the revenue out of their businesses, and that is uh, agricultural transportation. Uh, uh, exports depend on uh, 
being able to be containerized in our industry and be exported abroad, and the higher costs and the equipment shortages that we're seeing in uh, steamship lines and container shipping are having a real impact, uh, not only on farmers who are growing crops, but the freight forwarders, the trucking industries, and the regional groups that are trying to get this stuff out of the country, and in particular, the difficulties of getting it out of rural areas. So the Specialty Soy and Grains Alliance is an alliance of the small business entrepreneurs in rural America who are um, buying crops, loading them into containers, uh, using identity preserved <coughs> systems to deliver high quality, uh, often food grade uh, crops to customers abroad. Uh, it is difficult uh, work. Uh, it requires a meticulous attention to detail to garner that uh, premium price uh, in the food grade area and for the high demand animal feeds like distilled dry grains. And, and since the uh, imposition of the tariffs uh, back haul uh, costs are up, uh, it is difficult to find a container sometimes in the United States. And we're hoping for solutions to those problems. Uh, I think people assume that in the commodity area, uh, we're dependent on barges and ocean traffic uh, out of the major crop terminal ports. Uh, uh, but I'll remind you that about often in April and May, about 20% of the field crops we export exited the United States in a container, 20% or more. And our group works on the high end with technologies you're familiar with from the news, blockchain and other areas to load uh, products in, in rural America, like uh, uh, high quality soybeans for Japan, uh, Korea, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia uh, for crops that will be sorted optically, bagged, palletized, and placed in a container and shipped abroad. A farmer likes this kind of arrangement because they can earn a $75 to $125 premium per acre, which in these conditions is a make or break. Uh, uh, but due to the tariffs and the change in markets, uh, we know that things are tough on the farm. Uh, uh, some of our member companies report that uh, uh, before they were, their farmer was allowed to contract with them for these high-grade products, uh, they needed permission to do that from their bank, uh, which is a real indication of uh, a farm, farm communities that are on the edge. Our members of the Farm to Table Solution, um, uh, they're entrepreneur, entrepreneurial enough to see the value in rural communities. Um, there's just really significant market instability in container shipping. Uh, it's hard enough to find an empty container to fill and schedule out of North Dakota, Minnesota, or Ohio on a good day. So what's going on? The, the trade conflict is brought on an imbalance of equipment. Um, our members are having new transport headaches, uh, uh, costing them their revenue. So why, uh, in 2018, China supplied U.S. importers with 52% of our furniture, 53% of our footwear, 83% of our cell phones, 94% of our laptops. And uh, those containers not coming into the United States uh, uh, means there's fewer empty containers available for backhaul, uh, not just go ahead and back to China, but to any other destination. So uh, I'll... Um, IHS market chief economist Nariman Farabesh will pass on his quote that said he, he thought that, uh, as, as Laura indicated, uh, this was going to cut 0.3% uh, uh, of US GDP, as much as 0.6 or 0.8 as it continued, and as well a percentage point off uh, uh, growth of global GDP. Uh, you know, we're slowing down demand for our products abroad just in China, but globally, if this continues. Uh, usually, container shipments uh, uh, grow abroad at uh, uh, four or five percent a year. Uh, uh, global container shipments are likely only to rise about two percent, uh, according 
things in the wind impacts perimeter barometer at ACM. Uh, and, you know, the forecast for container shipping in Asia is to be down 8% this year. I did want to talk that uh, how exports dropped off the cliff. Uh, our U.S. containerized exports to China dropped 24% in, in 2018 uh, uh, compared to 2017. And, and let's face facts, for an uh, important port to agriculture, like uh, you, know, you hear about the Gulf, but think of the port of Los Angeles, uh, they report that their trade has fallen off significantly, meaning jobs at home. I, I really think that what this gets to uh, is the example for you, is that we're going to test the boundaries of the law of unintended consequences. I, I, only history will know uh, or be able to tell us whether these tactics have been effective. Uh, but I can tell you now that it, you, know, you hear about the difficulties for farmers on the line, but there's also uh, difficulties ahead ag transportation, uh, made more difficult uh, by the tragic weather we've had. I uh, talked to Senator Linkford about Oklahoma. There's hardly barge traffic moving through these areas uh, because of the weather difficulties. Look, I, I do want to emphasize that China earned this trade stand up. Uh, they need to do more. Uh, in March, uh, if you watch trade, the telltale example of why an uh, issue is going to get resolved is, you know, we had what happened. Uh, the U.S. Uh, a trade group based in Beijing uh, started casting around for funding for a victory party. Well, turn the tables and, and nothing happened. We got more tariffs out of the deal. Both sides need to reach deep and find solutions to this. And, China, I mean, China, please try once or twice uh, to follow through uh, on a dispute settlement issue with uh, fulfilling the spirit of, of what the WTO has asked you to do. Uh, those kinds of commitments, I think, will move us ahead. But we have some other regulatory fixes. It's pretty expensive to get certification in rural areas. We're talking to the administration about how to help them. Thank you. Yeah. So I think you've seen that there's a, a there's a, a lot of implications about the tariffs. Um, I think the one thing that we're hearing, and I, I think is a, I think it was Senator Langford who said, or both of them said, you know, China's not paying these tariffs. The people who are paying the tariffs are going to be the U.S. manufacturers, and at the in the end of the day, it's going to be consumers. Um, I think, Laura, you pointed out what the additional costs could be, and what that could be not only on a per family basis but what it's going to be in the cost of jobs. Um, I've, I have heard you know, some sentiments with respect to the um, agriculture industry. I've heard some frustration voiced by some of my uh, companies who are in the manufacturing industry that they're the ones paying the tariffs. They're the ones who are having to uh, you know, pay this additional 25%, but yet then the president announces the $16 billion bailout, or I don't even call it a bailout, $16 billion help for the farming community on top of, I think, the $12 billion that he had done previously. So now, you know, we're talking about nearly $30 billion that I think the manufacturing uh, industry is feeling, well, the farmers are getting, they're going to get taken care of anyway, Wait, but what about us? And what are we going to do? So just maybe some perspective of, you know, I see that there's impacts on both sides, but I mean, how are the farmers, they seem to be supportive of the president and what he's doing and the action is taken. And do you think that's because of the fact that they are getting some relief uh, in other methods? I, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I think uh, you, you, can't, uh, just, you, you can't ask any business how they're going to vote on an issue because they're going to vote with their values. Uh, yes, we've been, the administration has been moving some payments to farmers. <laughs> it won't be enough. Uh, things are bad out there in terms of uh, stockpiles of goods and terrible weather. Uh, we know people are going under. Congratulations and thank you to Secretary Purdue. He has the statutory authority given to him by Congress uh, to create such programs. And as 
usual, the secretary has balanced, uh, has well balanced his proposal about uh, emergency payments with uh, investing in uh, uh, agricultural groups for additional market development uh, to find new markets. Uh, agriculture is a complicated business, and, and I'll go back to our group, which is an example. Uh, uh, we're building jobs in rural communities. The, the, that these uh, companies can operate uh, uh, nearby the farm uh, provides uh, jobs and insurance in uh, communities that don't have much besides agriculture going. Uh, it's been important to help. Uh, uh, like the two senators show, uh, we would prefer to have markets open. Uh, uh, we want market opening agreements. The USMCA passed, and, and we can move ahead. I think there's a lot, of, you know, not only focusing on the, the China issues we talked about as well, we have the Mexico threat. <coughs> Um, we have the potential that uh, if we don't pass the USMCA, are we going to have the NAFTA? Are we going to have no agreement? What is going to happen? Um, I was wondering, Laura, if you've taken a look at all at that as a factor as well, you know, and, I, and maybe you hadn't in your earlier uh, runnings of the numbers considered 5, 10, 15, 25 percent tariffs on goods coming in from Mexico, but do you have any guesstimate of what something like that might do as to the as you? <laughs> talked about earlier. Oh man, it would really it would really rocket them up. Um, somebody mentioned to me not long ago that the average uh, MFN rate on imports from Mexico absent NAFTA would be on the order of four point, I don't like eight percent or something. So were we to terminate NAFTA imports from Mexico on average would be a four point eight percent tariff. So a five percent tariff is the more than the equivalent of canceling NAFTA. And when we did look at that, um, that question, what's the effect of terminating NAFTA on the U.S. economy uh, for the business roundtable, we did it, um, I have to say, uh, with a, an employment assumption where we assumed that there was a lot of unemployment in the United States because at the time we did the study, there was. Um, so these numbers are on the high side. We were getting 2 million plus job losses uh, nationally just from terminating NAFTA. So even if it's half of that, um, it's a huge, it's, it, it would hugely ramp up those estimates that we got for the, the tariffs on uh, steel, aluminum, and 301. Um, and, and I should also add, those, those tariffs included retaliation. So we included retaliation in our estimates for canceling NAFTA, too. So, Guy, um, again, looking at, you're in the, the supply chain, so you, you supply the methionine, which is then used and put into the feed grain um, by companies here. Uh, I imagine that they also export that. They may use it here in the United States, but they may be exporting as well. So if we're looking at um, uh, these trade wars going on, how does it further impact not only what is happening with respect to the Chinese tariffs being imposed, but what's happening if we were to lose the NAFTA and the price now of the feed grain going into Mexico is going to increase? How does that impact you? And how do you kind of back that out as to what might be uh, what you all may be looking at if something like this 